Hello everyone, I'm William Gentry from the University of Idaho, and this is Managing Invasive Plants for REM 151. So why should we care about invasive plants and the spread of noxious weeds? It signals an ecological decline of the entire watershed or the area in question. It reduces the beauty and biodiversity of natural areas, can cause widespread economic losses, <clears throat> and is a problem for all kinds of areas whether it be urban, rural, private, state, or federal lands. Uh, these noxious weeds don't care about boundaries or barriers. They go wherever they want, wherever there's a suitable place for them to, to grow and spread. These noxious weed species spare no segment of society. They affect us all, whether we're ranchers, farmers, fishermen, or cyclers, hikers, hunters, uh, everyone's affected. And they will spread unmanaged <clears throat> when unmanaged. And they will spread rapidly. On the left, we have the University of Idaho's Noxious Weeds 7th Edition booklet in PDF form. And on the right, we have the State of Idaho's Control Strategies and Weed List. Uh, go ahead and pause and copy these and put them in your search bar. And go ahead and look at these now. Although this lecture is mostly focused on plants, it is worth noting that exotic invasive species um, could include animals, um, vertebrates and invertebrates alike, uh, microbes and viruses, and I've got some examples here um, that most of you should know about. Um, the European starling, you, some of you might not know about that one. It's a, it's a bird that is displacing a lot of other native birds. Uh, fire ants have been a problem as well as killer bees. Wild boars, as we all know, have been causing millions of dollars in crop damage throughout the south. Um, there's a, a white nose syndrome, which is a uh, fungus um, that is affecting a lot of uh, bats and killing off a lot of populations of bats in the northeast. Um, it's spreading west also. Uh, chestnut blight has wiped out millions of chestnut trees on the east. Um, and we're pretty familiar, I'm sure, all with uh, Zika virus and West Nile. But these are also invasives and they're also exotic. So although this lecture is about plants, just keep that in mind that it can include other things. Now I'd like you guys to think about different reasons that weeds could be good or bad. Uh, think about both the positive and negative impacts on ecological and socioeconomic landscapes. And go ahead and pause it now and brainstorm and think about it and then move on. So here are some of the reasons that we came up with. Uh, there are likely more and some of you might have wrote those down, but this is what we came up with and uh, I think it's a pretty good list. Um, go ahead and review what you had and compare it to what we have. So uh, what can be done about all this? Prevention. It's the single best way to limit impacts of non-native species. Early detection and rapid response. Um, it's pretty much the only way that you're going to ever be able to eradicate something is if you get it early and you have a rapid response to it. Um, beyond that, you're looking at uh, the different control methods. There's biological, there's chemical, and there's mechanical. Um, biological is introducing a natural enemy, uh, whether it be um, a predator or a parasite or some sort of fungus or some sort of bacterium. Um, chemical methods usually are um, herbicides and mechanical is the, the one where you're going to be physically removing these invasive species, um, chopping it down with a machete or pulling it from the ground or using a chain to drag it across the landscape and remove items. Uh, research, this is where you're going to get all your information on how to uh, limit it by using its own life cycle against it, finding out when it's most vulnerable, finding out um, what stage of life you need to attack it at. Restoration, and this comes in when you start knocking out these weed species. Um, how do you build the community back up so you make sure they don't return, or at least uh, try to limit the impacts in the future? And the most important is education and public awareness. It's hard to make any headway with weeds if the public isn't behind it. Land planning with weeds should involve uh, proper prevention and early detection. In order to prevent the weeds from coming in in the first place, you need to consider the vectors of introduction. You need to develop plans to minimize introduction and you need to minimize disturbances that may favor weeds. Um, but you also need to have a plan for early detection in place and develop a strategy for how you're going to do that. And you also have to have a strategy for eradicating them uh, whenever they, whenever possible. 
maintaining a healthy plant community is important in making sure that weeds don't come in in the first place or that they stay out after you've removed them. Uh, this is planting uh, native plants that use up all the available resources at all different levels uh, of this soil so that there's no available resources for the weeds when they try to come in. So the different weed control approaches we talked about earlier, um, we're going to go over them in more detail now, uh, starting with a chemical. And this is, like I said, those herbicides um, that are used to reduce and prevent weeds. So first on our list for proven uses of herbicides on rangelands, we have um, controlling undesirable plants to favor more desirable species. We have increasing effectiveness of mechanical fire or biological methods um, when you use them in conjunction with uh, chemical applications, such as if you were to go in there with a machine and remove some trees or some um, black greasewood, um, going through afterwards and spot treating certain areas with chemicals uh, could prove pretty effective. We have the repeated examples of rejuvenation of tall shrubs and low trees after um, treating areas around them for weeds so that they don't steal nutrients from these larger plants. And a lot of these are used as forage by big game. Um, we have the possibility of eradicating poisonous plants from certain pastures that um, could prove to be fatal for some livestock. And if you catch it early enough, you have the opportunity to possibly eradicate small infestations of um, weeds that might pop up in your pasture. And on the more extreme end of the use of chemicals for treating of weeds, you have the option to kill off the entire existing plant community and uh, reseed and replant in order to prevent uh, future reintroduction. Uh, another proven use of these herbicides is the maintenance control uh, or retreatment when applied periodically following primary treatment. The going back and the spot treating to make sure that the weeds don't take back over again. Next up is mechanical and that is like I said earlier the removal of weeds by pulling or chopping down or using a chain or any other mechanical or physical method. Here we have some examples of mechanical treatments. We've got brush sculpting which is done for multiple reasons, including uh, wildlife and endangered species habitat restoration, watershed management, uh, recreation purposes, as well as livestock uh, grazing purposes. You've got shredding or mastication that's done there at the bottom showing that. And also in the upper right, you can go ahead and watch this video of uh, chaining operations going on. And this is done to uproot trees and shrubs um, and create seed beds. Um, you can go ahead and watch the video and learn more about it. Next up, we've got biological controls, and that's the suppression of weeds using living organisms. We'll go over some definitions and some examples here now. So what is biological control? Like I said, it's the planned use of living organisms to reduce the vigor, reproductive capacity, density, or effect of weeds. Um, here's an example right here of a beetle on um, St. John's ward. So what are the requirements necessary for biological control agents to be successful? They have to be destructive enough to control weeds. They also have to be host specific enough not to endanger non-target species. And they also have to be able to survive and reproduce in target environments. It's actually pretty hard to find um, pathogens or pests that meet all three of these criteria. And it's really important that uh, scientists do lots of experiments to find out if they do fit all three of those. And here's a, an example of a quarantine test done on some scotch thistle for a parasite they're testing out for viability. Here's an example of what can be done over a short period of time using a pest species that meets all those criteria. Um, you've got this leaf beetle that was placed on the salt cedar. And you look down there in the bottom left corner that says June 2006. And just a short time later in August of 06, you can see the drastic change that it's done to this riparian area next to this road and how much salt cedar is gone. This is a good video about biological control on leafy spurge and where it came from and where we're at today. So go ahead and stop the slide uh, and go ahead and watch this video. 
here are some very interesting links about um, cheatgrass fungus called black fingers of death and it's pretty interesting how it affects these seeds that are in the ground um, and it affects them in ways that chemicals just can't so go ahead and watch this video uh, read these articles it's pretty interesting um, the last one is uh, cultural and this is uh, how you manage um, your practices of the land you're fertilizing you're cultivating you're grazing you're burning just press weeds um, go ahead and read this article it's a pretty good piece about how one town in, in uh, Montana is using sheep in order to manage their weed problem So what can be done? Um, we've kind of gone over this a little bit, but this is a good graph that shows um, weeds being introduced, um, detection right here, and this just shows that uh, at this point, eradication is feasible, but beyond this point, it's going to be very difficult. Um, the bad part, and this is what shows here, is that um, public awareness typically begins here, because this is when it starts to affect large groups of people. And it just shows that after this point, it's really unlikely that you're going to be able to remove this pest and it's going to cost infinitely more money. So the, the quicker we can get a hold of a situation and the quicker we can get the public aware of the problem and the quicker we can get people on board with fixing these problems before they become big, the better. And that's pretty much just all this shows. Proper land planning with weeds requires a good weed survey. Uh, you need to collect information about these weeds, biology and ecology. You need to understand and document their growth requirements, and you need to identify sites susceptible to invasion on your property. You need to evaluate the progress of your weed management plan also. Um, some good mapping um, to mark down the extent of your weed problem, uh, the different control activities that are done, where they're done at, and just monitoring the spread over time is important for um, utilizing your resources wisely in the future. So these are the different resources we talked about earlier, chemical, biocontrol, cultural, and mechanical, um, that are all used together for this integrated weed management plan. Coordinated weed management groups, whether they be formal or informal, are important for getting uh, large scale projects done that wouldn't necessarily be possible with one group alone. This allows you to leverage resources such as time, equipment, money, expertise, and it also makes it possible for you to apply for certain state and federal funds that might not be available for an individual. As with all science, monitoring and evaluation um, is extremely important, and you need to understand um, if the weed population you treated with whatever method you chose or methods um, did it adequately, adequately suppress them? What was the cost of this suppression? Um, were any non-targets affected? Uh, should the treatment be repeated or modified? Um, some of these treatments, such as chemical, uh, won't be very effective the first round. Sometimes they require uh, multiple rounds of treatment over a long period of time. Um, were land management goals met? Uh, after you answer all these questions, um, along with filling out those maps and those those things we talked about earlier, you can start to get a good picture of where you really need to go in the future. And you need, you're able to uh, quantify with numbers how effective or not effective what you've done in the past was. Here's another good video about uh, cattle creating fire breaks um, via targeted grazing. So go ahead and pause now and go ahead and watch this video.
Lastly, we'll cover the basic steps you want to follow for weed control. You need to first prioritize your goals. Do you aim to eradicate or merely contain an infestation? Which weeds are your highest priorities in the short term versus long term? What are the potential impacts of various weeds that you may treat? Which weeds are listed on the federal, state, or county noxious weeds list? Uh, this will dictate who you contact to get appropriated certain funding for you or your group. It will also tell you sometimes um, different methods you can or cannot use for controlling these weeds. You need to monitor. You need to carefully follow the progress of your efforts and make corrections to your activities as needed um, to include follow-up treatments as necessary. And lastly, revegetation. It's important that while you want to rid an area of invasive plants, you also want to promote the restoration of native plant communities. And that's it. Uh, you guys have a good day. Take care. Hello everyone, I'm William Gentry from the University of Idaho, and this is Managing Invasive Plants for REM 151.